Blog Talk Radio. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to Late Night Leo's. This is your host, Morgan from Thor Gecko, and I have my guest co-host, Wally from Supreme Gecko. Wally, you want to say hello? Good evening, everybody. All right, so tonight we have Alicia Hamilton from Southern Style Geckos. Tonight's episode is brought to you by our generous sponsors, Luxurious Leopards, Holly's Homebred Reptiles, Lilith's Leo Lovables, Brad SC Geckos, and Desert Snow Geckos. So, uh, Alicia, you want to say hello to everybody? Hi, everybody. So, why don't you go ahead and jump into how you got into animals and reptiles and, you know, what, what got you going in all of this and fueled your passion? Well, I've always been around animals since I was little. I've always had dogs, cats, horses. I got my first reptile when I was eight years old. And kind of since then, I've sparked into other things and started with Leo's, fell in love with them. And now I've branched into Cresteds and just now into Beardeds. So it's always been a longtime passion of mine. Right on. What kind of beardeds are you working with? I have a hypo citrus female and a hypo red female and then a leatherback citrus. Nice. Are you going to be breeding those this year? Um, Not this year. Probably in the next couple of years. That's cool. So uh, what what kind of leopard gecko projects are you working on? Right now, mainly the Total Eclipse and my rainwater project and a special project I'm calling Agent Orange. Right on. And what's in the uh, Agent Orange? Um, a lot of high-quality tangerines. Uh, my base females are... Uh, one's Tangerine Tornado and a couple are just high quality, super high post. Right on. And uh, what are you working towards in the Total Eclipse project? I'm working more towards getting a purified line and more of, you know, the whited out look, a white face, white legs. Nice. How is, uh, Alicia, how is that going so far with the Total Eclipse? I saw the web page, and, and you have some beautiful animals. It's going pretty good. I've been holding back some of the um, lighter animals. Um, I've got a couple of Max Nose that I'm going to be breeding this year to throw some new blood in that are pretty light. Um, I have been keeping them kind of private, haven't put any pictures of them up yet. Are there certain breeders that you're looking at in the hobby that uh, you want to bring in their lines and and add to your lines to strengthen them? Um, you know, you're working with some uh, lovely total eclipses, and uh, are you trying to build up that that bloodline? I am. Um, the ones that I have now are from Rampant Reptiles. Um, Michelle does a great job with the bloodlines that she has. And then I also am pulling in uh, a couple other bloodlines that I created myself. How long have you been working with that project? I've been working with that project for a couple of years. And ultimately you'd like to see, what, a more white animal? Yeah, an, an animal that's got, a, you know, a high white content and lesser of the dark speckling that you're seeing in most total eclipses now. Okay. And how long have you been working with that Agent Orange? That's a pretty cool project. Um, I actually just started with that last year. Um, I hatched out a female that I held back that kind of spurred me into that. She's very, very neon orange and with the keratin going 
seventy-five percent down her tail. Nice. And are you uh, are you bringing anything else back into that project? Are you looking at uh, certainly continuing that Agent Orange project, but also kind of branching off and using some of those colors in any other project? I have thought about transferring it into a couple of my other projects, um, just to put a little more color into some of my Tremper and Las Vegas lines. And what other projects are you working with? Um, I think I saw Halloween. Yeah, I do have a, a small Halloween project that I've been working with, um, trying to produce a little bit darker of an animal. Uh, it's got more pattern than what we've been seeing. Yeah, what, I would. Uh, I, what made you come? Go ahead, Morgan. Oh, I was just going to say that I, I think that uh, if you were to combine any project, it would be really cool, like with the way that Ray was going with his Zorro Bandits, is if you used your Agent Orange and combined it with your Halloween Mask project. I've, I've thought about that. Um, I've actually got a small set, group set aside that are from the Agent Orange project and the Halloween Mask that... I ultimately was thinking calling them spot nose because they've all got a complete circle right between their nostrils. Nice. And the yeah, colors I, I are really, coming out amazing. Yeah, I think that orange and bold is going to be just as popular as black and bold has been for the last five years. So, I mean, if, if you've got the genetics, now would be the time to jump on it, especially being a new breeder. By the time you're, like, in five more years and you've got, like, this really wicked project, you know, you could actually, like, slap your name on it, you know? Yeah. I saw some, uh, I think they're reverse stripe trumpers out there as well. Um, are you taking that down its own project as well, or are you uh, incorporating that into some of your other projects? Uh, my reverse stripe raptors I've got in the Total Eclipse project, which I actually got them from Morgan. Very nice. One of my favorites. I love the reverse stripes. They're definitely a classic. And you're working yeah, that I, within your, your your total eclipse project? I am working them in. I'm breeding my first reverse stripe this year. Go ahead, Morgan. Sorry about that. Oh, I was just going to say that, yeah, uh, it, it always sucks when you sell an animal and then someone sends you a picture like, six months later, and you're like, oh, my God, I want it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's but nice to see how I, they turn out like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I could do that with almost every gecko. So. <laughs> we do yeah. that with some of our crusteds. Um, because of all the colors, you don't know what you, you really have until they grow up a little bit. Um, speaking of crusteds, how... Are you uh, move, moving a little bit into that as well, Alicia, into the crusteds? I have. I've got a small breeder group that I've started over the past year and a half that I'm mainly working with the extreme harlequin, the tiger dalmatian. And uh, what's pull you, pulling you in that direction? You know, those um, colors and those patterns. Well, I've always loved the classic look of the Harlequin. And the couple of Harlequins I'm working with have got some very high flaming on the sides that I would love to introduce into a, a, a purified tiger line. Very nice, and get more of that harlequin in, in involved in that project. Very nice. And how long have you been working with Crusteds? 
Um, about a year and a half. Okay. Any babies so far? No, not yet. This will be the first season breeding. Very nice. Very exciting. It is. I've definitely got my work cut out for the summer. <laughs> A couple yeah, of you, different challenges. Keep... Oh, go ahead, Wally. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, just a couple of different challenges with crusteds um, as opposed to leopards. It's it's always interesting keeping both both uh, groups of animals. Yeah, I actually yeah. keep my crest my crested in a totally separate room of the house. That's I call it the tropical room. Trying to keep them yeah, a little bit cooler. Yeah. I was going to ask that. Yeah, and how do you how do you set up your crested geckos? Do you have individual tanks or do you use tubs or how do you do that? Well, since I have such a small breeding colony right now, I'm using the exoterras and they seem this community seems to be keeping pretty good and temperature staying right where I want it to be. So for right now, I'm probably just going to stick with that. Right on. And on that yeah, same line, how do you keep your leopard geckos? Uh, I keep them in a rack system. Okay. Did you build your own rack? Did you uh, did you go out and, and uh, purchase a rack? I actually I have two. I actually built myself. Very nice. Any challenges with with building your own rack? Um, not really. The only challenge I had was deciding what to heat it with. And are you going with the the flex watt? Going with belly I heat? Yeah, I, I do have belly heat. How many just kind of curious, how many tubs per rack? The adult rack holds thirty two and the hatchling Holds, I think, sixty. And did you start with um, um, aquariums, and did you move into racks recently? I had aquariums when I first got into them, when I only had maybe a handful to work with. But then I found it it's just easier to do a rack system. It's easier. To keep it sanitized and keep everything clean. Yeah, I've, I've you, uh, that I have the same. Uh, it's way easier to keep racks clean. I've I've gone over that to that route too with uh, leopards and and even crusted geckos. Um, I have a few in. Uh, glass tanks, but I also have uh, a number in plastic tubs. It just seems to to work out a lot easier. Yeah, it does. Any? Like I said I have I have the the leopards in the racks, and then I have the cresteds and my other desert species, such as the beardeds and the urmastics and aquariums. Trying to maintain that heat in one area. Yeah, they're all in the same room. What kind of urine do you have? Oh, go ahead, Wally. What was it? No, uh, no, go ahead, Al. Alicia. I was just what kind of see what Morgan. What kind of euros do you have? Right now, I'm working with the Yellow Saharans. Nice. Do you plan on breeding those this next year? Probably not next year. Probably in the next couple of years. Okay. Yeah, I know that that's a, that's a whole other kind of hatchling setup. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have to add on to your house. 
at the moment now, reptiles outnumber me. <laughs> <laughs> I've wow. never kept uh, your. I've never kept euros. What kind of uh, challenges do they present? Do they take a lot of room? No, not a lot of room. Um, standard, you know, four by two. Okay, just best Basic, for them. Basically like uh, bearded dragons for the most part? For the most part, they, they require, you know, very little to no humidity. So that's one thing I do like about having them in a glass terrarium versus anything else. Do you need UV for that? You, have- you do. I use the uh, Reptisun 10.0. And do you have your eye on any other type of reptiles Um, as far as in the future? I keep my eyes open. Um, There definitely is a lot of things that catch my eye when I'm going to shows and looking at what everybody else is producing. But nothing's definite as of right now. Alicia, do you go to a number of shows in your area? I try to go to the majority of the ones that are within a five-hour limit just to see, you know, what everybody is breeding and what they're producing. Do you find that you have a pretty good selection of animals at, at some of the shows around your area? Most of them have a pretty good selection. Now, are you vending shows as well right now? Not or have at you in the, the past? I have vended okay. in the past. Um, I actually vended at my first show last summer. And how did that go? Very well. I've sold out the second day. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Two-day show? How- yes, yeah. Saturday How many animals? Uh, I think I had one table, so probably thirty or forty. Wow! Very nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, Was that mostly uh, leopard geckos? No, mostly. That was mostly, you said it was mostly leopard geckos? Yeah, I had a couple crusteds, but right it on. was my majority of leopards. Yeah, that's that's really good for a uh, first show. Uh, and I don't think we said where you're at. Where are you located? I'm in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Okay. Right, so you go to like the, what's that, the Rayleigh, North Carolina show? Um, I do. I'll go to the Charleston show, Columbia show, and then as far as North Carolina, uh, Durham and Raleigh and Charlotte. Right on. Yeah, I just wanted to get that because I mean, people listening to the show might, you know, want to come say hi, or <laughs> you know, now that they know what you're working with, they'll know what you bring to the to the shows. But uh, being new in the market, have you noticed? Any issues with how you have to conduct your pricing and things like that? Pricing wise, it's pretty competitive because you don't want to price anything too high because you, you, nobody knows who you are yet. But it, yeah, having having that competitive pricing definitely helps. Okay. And uh, what what kind of feeders do you use for all your animals? Um, 
mainly use mealworms and dubia roaches. Okay. Wally, you back with us? I am back. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. I lost I was everything where you here. Went. <laughs> There's a, a big long pause and <laughs> everything blacked out. So I apologize. <laughs> <sighs> I, I okay. caught uh, just the end of that feeder, uh, what you're using for feeders, Alicia. I'm I'm sorry, you're using dubias and, and what else? Mealworms. Mealworms? How about crickets? Or do you just hate them as much as I hate them? <laughs> I'll use them if necessary. I definitely do prefer <laughs> the dubia roaches because they are a lot quieter and don't smell as bad. Yes. Yes. Now, are you raising your own dubias? I am. Very good. I'm starting to, um, and I want to try to uh, produce more so I can get rid of the, the uh, crickets. How are you, how do you have your setup? I have been set up in a um, one of the big stair-like tubs. I think it's 58-gallon with egg crate and... Um, Roach chow and oranges and water crystals. Okay. And how much heat are you are are you giving them? They have a, uh, I think it's a four watt heating pad on the on a piece of tile under one side. Keeps them pretty hot. Uh, as hot as they need to be, hot enough that they breed. Successfully, I think that's the the mistake that a lot of people make is that they don't uh, keep their dubias warm enough. I think that a lot of people think that they can, you know, put them all together and the roaches and they'll just start breeding, you know, because of that. And you know, I think that it's proper food that you you have to feed them, but you've got to keep them real hot too. You do. They're actually in. The desert room, as I call it, where I keep <laughs> the, the ambient temperature around 81, 82. And, and the then they have the breeding... horse. Perfect. I am. I do breed both. How are you doing with the mealworms and breeding them? Uh, it's off and on. I'll ha I'll have a spike in in growth and then they'll dole out for a little while. But it's been an, it's been enough to sustain what I'm feeding. And do you have a uh a pretty good setup for the, the mealworms? A couple of bins with uh with the uh wheat brand on the bottom and how do you have them set up? I I do use um the wheat bran and oatmeal, and I, I actually grind it and, so that it's a little bit easier to sustain the mealworms on, and it's easier to sort them out. That's a great idea. Makes it easier to uh, to get them out of there instead of picking them all the time. Now, why do you think that they spike and, and then uh, uh, go down again? Any ideas? Well, I've noticed right you know, right after I've had a big spike in the population, a lot of the beetles are starting to to die off. So it's taking a little bit more time for the the new crop of breeders to get up to size and be able to lay eggs. Okay. Now, do you do anything different for feeding in the springtime when you're you're starting your breeding programs? Do you do you change your your diet or change supplement supplementation or anything like that? I try to increase their diet right before the breeding season, just so I make sure that I've got plenty of of weight on my females that I won't have any issues with them being too thin at the end of breeding season. 
Are you brumating your your uh, flubber geckos, or have you in the past? I did this year. Uh, I lowered the temp- temperatures at the beginning of December and let the collection brumate for majority of December, and then heating them back up probably mid January. And slow down feeding, discontinued feeding? Just slow down. Did you, uh, just kind of curious, did you uh, brumate the previous year? I didn't. I and why uh, Why did you broom? I'm sorry. I had spoke with a couple of readers and um got their opinions on whether they think it's more productive to to let them naturally go through the processes. And I, I'm seeing now with several of my females ovulating that it, it it helps to let them go through the natural processes. That makes all the sense in the world in that natural cooling down and then warming back up again, you just kind of set them to a, a cycle and a schedule and easier for them, easier for us as the breeder to kind of plan around that a little bit. Easier for us to warm them up and, you know, really pump the females full of food. Yeah, I try to keep what, uh, all my girls as fat and sassy as I can. <laughs> I bet you they're fat coming coming into the season. I've got some that are topping out 75, 80 grams. Oh, my goodness. Now, have you thought about uh, waxworms at all? I do waxworms very rarely. Then I'll do them on occasion, maybe... Maybe once a month. Or... Just more as a treat than than a, a staple food. Yeah, I li- I like to give them as a treat, and mainly give them if I've got a gecko that you know it needs to put weight on, and that they're easy for that aspect. Leos take them, the the males and females take them and just uh, scarf them down. <laughs> and you watch your fingers when you're giving them to them. <laughs> yeah. So are there any other feeders what? that you give your geckos? Um, I, I do have superworms also that I'll supplement once to twice a week just to give give them a variety of food. Okay. Do you breed your own superworms? I have not tackled that task yet. <laughs> yeah. They're not as, I can't as, keep as, them as easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. I think that the people that are breeding the superworms have a special knack of brown thumb or, or whatever to, to breed them. Yeah, uh, definitely. A special talent. Definitely agree. Oh, Alicia, why don't you run through a typical day uh, at Southern Style Geckos? How does your day begin and what are some of the tasks that you go through and what are some of the things that you do in the facility? Uh, normal day, you know, get up in the morning and Check all my lay boxes to see if anybody's laid, and make sure everybody has food and water and has a you know, clean cage. And then we'll come back in the afternoon and pretty much do that over again. Uh, the majority of the cleaning and you know just health-wise, checking everybody in the afternoons. What are some of your favorite tasks 
and what are some of your least favorite tasks in your uh, in your facility? Um, I'd have to say my favorite task is definitely going to the incubator and, and seeing when I've got hatchlings in there walking around. And then worst task would probably be monthly sanitation. <laughs> Now, does that involve pulling down every single enclosure and, and doing a, a complete clean on them? Yes, I, I try to do that at least once a month. It's a pretty big chore, isn't it? Definitely is, and I definitely couldn't imagine with some of the larger collections like Say Sobek and hmm. Ron Tremper. I, I can't and, imagine how they get it done. <laughs> what do you use to sanitize? I mainly like to use the Corhex. Um, okay. I just it, it has a semi pleasant smell and it, it it's pretty effective as far as sanitation goes. Yeah, I haven't tried that one yet. I, I bought a bottle of it, but I don't know. I, I have a really crazy cleaning schedule that I do. So I don't. One day I'll try the chlorhexidine. Yeah, I use the, the um, 4% for, it's like, cage cleaning and sanitation, and then I'll use the two percent for health reasons, like if anybody has an abrasion that needs to be cleaned. Okay. And you just mix that in a sprayer and do that, or how does that work? I mix it in a sprayer. I, I'll do one to three parts water. Do you, uh, does your family help you in the gecko hobby at all? Do they come down and help you uh, move animals and, and clean tanks and, and feed and, and look for babies? It would be nice, but unfortunately it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Not convinced the rest of the family that they're as lovable as your other pets, like dogs and cats. Are they are they uh, receptive to the the reptiles? Will they hold the reptiles and? They'll hold them uh, as long as they know it's not going to bite them. <laughs> you think that someday they'll they'll be a part more of a part of your your hobby and your business? Um, I think the more they learn about them and the more they're around them, they tend to help out a little bit more and it mainly depends on which species I'm working with. Do they tend to more more uh, work with the, the bearded dragons as they're a little bit easier to handle and rather than the, uh, the leopard geckos? Uh, as far as the Leos and the Beardies, it's about the same. The one that's not as handleable are the some of the younger Cresteds and the Euromastics. You were talking about the cleaning and, and the whole process, your, your normal day. What are some of the things that uh, are outside of the, the normal day, some of the things that kind of take you away from um, the normal uh, tasks that you have in your uh, facility? Well, definitely working a full-time schedule and finishing up college does hinder most of what I try to get done in a day. 
how in the world do you find the time, especially if you're you're working full time and going to college? I pretty much make time. <laughs> Are you more of a morning person or a night person? Do you spend most of your time in the facility? Do you find you you uh, spend more time in the the morning or uh, the evenings? I'm definitely more of a morning person. I spend a little bit more time in the morning as far as checking lay boxes and incubators to making making sure that everybody's set up once they hatch and putting eggs in the incubator as I'm pulling hatchlings out. I can see you running around with one book in a hand, in one hand and and uh working uh with the animals uh pulling uh eggs and and putting them in the incubator with the other hand. Yeah, most of the time there's at least a beauty or or a Leo on my shoulder while I'm walking around trying to do something. <laughs> Do you see yourself getting into any other animals, any other geckos? Um, is the crusted geckos kind of that's that's kind of the line that you've drawn well, for yourself? I, I definitely am drawn to gargles and other species such as the lichianus. Um, they're just amazing to me. I would love to work with them in the future. Do you see quite a number of of um, the racket atlas and uh, at the shows in your area? Not very many. Majority Even the lychees. Majority of anything you see is going to be the leopard geckos and crested. Uh, very rarely you'll find gargles. And even the lychees, it seems like the lychees are really taking off the last few years, and and they're becoming not not common, but more at least prevalent at some of the shows, at least around I, here. I was gonna say the last couple of years, I mean, they've been very sparingly. Uh, certain certain breeders will have them. Um, uh, to be honest, I haven't seen any in probably the past six months at any of the shows that I've gone to. My goodness. So you're you're doing these shows as well and you'll probably do more shows in 2014. Do you go to the shows with kind of one eye looking at animals and, and seeing what's out there but also another eye on how vendors have their tables set up and how they're working with customers, and are you pulling any tips away from the shows that way? I try to pull off as far as customer service goes. You know, the friendlier the better. The more you educate people, the more likely they're going to be to return to you in the future. Um, I, de I definitely put that on the hierarchy as top of the totem pole. And in any tips from successful breeders I do take in mind, um, I take those very graciously. Anything to help a new breeder is always appreciated. I sometimes think that, that people are afraid to ask vendors at shows because they feel that they're too busy or they don't want to share information for whatever reason. And I found it to be just exactly the opposite. Um, the shows where it seems like you can get more one-on-one -on -one attention, and certainly if somebody has a table full of customers, you, you don't, you know, find it as easy to ask basic questions. But um, you know, if there's a lull in, in uh, the customers coming through, it's just a perfect opportunity to start up a conversation and and ask some very specific questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm never really afraid to ask questions. I'm pretty much on the understanding with most of the breeders that I've 
contact it. If I have a question, they're very good about answering it. I think that's perfect. And just building up that re reputation and that rapport um, a show is just a great way to, to get some of that exchange going. If you're not afraid to ask the questions, then it sounds like you're you're a perfect vendor as well, working with the customers and keeping the conversation going and, and asking the right questions, which is so important in vending. It is. The more you can engage the public, the more they have a better experience. Now, for your shows, do you are you thinking about or have you developed some <clears throat> care sheets or information that you can hand out to the to the customers and something for them to take take away from the show? I do have care sheets. Uh, that's one thing that I pride on giving to anybody I sell a gecko to, just so they know, you know the proper setup and how they need to be taken care of. That's a great idea, and I think that it, that too kind of gives them something that they can go home with and read over. and And I'm assuming that you probably put your your uh, web page or Facebook page or your phone number, and it kind of opens up that communication and keeps it going as well. Yeah, everybody that has ever purchased a gecko from me, they have my number, my email, and if they ever have questions, I'm always available. Now, with the the leopard geckos, are you uh, are you going to move into any other projects? Are you are you looking at any other projects that uh, that kind of has your eye and and you want to kind of branch out a little bit into those projects? Maybe maybe develop something a little bit different to uh, bring to these shows and and you know get another uh, group of customers interested in. Uh, there's a couple I've been having my eye on. Um, nothing that I've set my heart to that I want to work with. Not something that you just have to have right now. Yeah, a lot of pretty stuff to look at, but nothing that <laughs> arms twisting I have to get. Well, it sounds like you have a really good focus on your projects and you know exactly what you want to do with your projects and and the the route that you want to go, especially this year. And I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, you you talk about uh, expanding into the other arboreal geckos. Have you ever thought about more uh, desert terrestrial geckos? Because you know, picta and knobtails are really picking up right now. I have noticed that on. Um I'm always open to trying something new just to keep that guessing game going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I I love the knob tails. I mean, I, they do do the whole cricket thing, and I hate crickets, but I don't know. But they will take dubias as well, too, so... Yeah, <laughs> I I sense some hesitation there. Well, I, you know, I I put in like a, I must have spent two hundred dollars buying all these roaches and stuff, and almost all of my geckos wouldn't eat them. So I've had horrible experience with the oh. dubia. Now, is that all all the geckos or just the leopard geckos, Morgan? Leopard geckos. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I might try roaches again with the new knobtail that I've got, but I don't know. I'm, I'm really hoping he switches over to mealworms. I find the the Australians fascinating as well. I've I've had some success with some of them and just some horrendous failures with others. It's a, a love hate relationship, that's for sure. Yeah. Have you noticed any different? Which ones are uh, have you had the issues with? Um, 
I brought in a pair of Amy. I, uh, I think it's been three years now, and they they did great for about a whole year. Um, female certainly looked like she was ready to breed, but I held off in, in breeding them. I kept them in their uh, two separate enclosures, and um, uh, one day went down, and um, the male was dead. Just uh, no signs of any issues whatsoever. Um, was eating uh, well, drinking, everything seemed to be just perfect. And um, you know, I've kept I'm keeping Wheeler Eye and and Levis Levis and a few others. But uh, these Amy Eye losing the male was really a big concern. And then about a month later, I lost the female, and uh, just wow. no ideas. And and the thing is that I, I talked to a number of people and. You know, we went over the husbandry and everything, and just no signs whatsoever of, of you know, what the issue was. So, it, so it's, sometimes they're a little bit frustrating, but they're just, you know, beautiful animals and unique characteristics. And that's one of those that one day in the future I'll try again, but, but not right now. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are your wheeler I mean? <laughs> <laughs> they they pretend like they are. Um, they're not so so bad, you know. The cool part about the Australians, some of the Australians, is that they they fire up and you you open the enclosure and they get on their their haunches and and they growl and bark and and do everything to intimidate you. But you know you pick one up and, and not that I handle them that much, but uh, you pick them up and they're just little puppy dogs. They're they're just the gentlest little thing. So they're all show. They're they're uh, not much bite to them. Okay. So if if I pick my wheeler eye up, it's not going to like eat my soul like I believe it will. <laughs> I say this, and and you're going to uh, Facebook me tomorrow and say I lost the tip of my finger because <laughs> you told me that I could pick up my wheeler eye. <laughs> <laughs> my whole arm, Wally. My whole my arm. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> It's now a stub. I can't use my left arm. <laughs> yeah, I I I have named it Satan because it hisses and growls, and it kind of does like you know how Chihuahuas when they bark they kind of like hop around, you know, but <laughs> really weird. Yeah. I mean, he does that, and I don't know the way they glare at you. Uh, I just feel like. A little bit of my happiness from my soul is kind of evaporating as he like glares at me. So uh, they're just they're sucking in the the life substance of, away from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think uh, that that's a lot of the appeal of the the Australians. But uh, you know, they're neat animals, and and uh, the the rough uh, knob tails are they're all. Bullies and they like to pretend like they're they're bad asses, but uh, but they're little puppy dogs. They're they're more show than anything. Yeah. And uh, Wally, what I I'm just curious, what of the different color patterns are you going to be hatching out this year? For the um for the wheeler, wheeler right, for the Australians. Yeah. Um, I'm working with a, a nice red. Um, line right now, but I have a female that I swear when I when I set her up to breed, and I don't know if this is true with all females, but she turned just as white as a piece of paper, um, just a, a just a beautiful white color with just barely noticeable striping. Um, I have some photos somewhere that I, I'll have to share, but. Um, it's very unique. I don't have any of the very specialized, you know, really high reds or um, I know that there's some um, less pattern animals out there, um, but I'm not working with those. I'm just, again, I'm trying to get my feet wet with them and get more of an understanding. I'm, I'm so hesitant to, to dig into and get too deep into the, the Australians. I'm, I feel like, you know, those... Amy, I really, really hit me pretty hard, but um, maybe in the future. I um, bred them last year, and I, I got uh, four eggs, and two of them hatched out, and uh, two were bad. first two that were bad, so, you know, that's a start. And I think that with anything like this, you get a good start. You, you gain more understanding. You you read as much as you can and, and 
like Alicia was saying, you know, you go to these shows and you talk to vendors and and get as much information as you possibly can from those that are already having success with the animals. Okay. Yeah. How much do your wheel or I go for? Um, in this market around here in the Chicago, Milwaukee area, they're right around two hundred and fifty or so. Okay. So I can as, send you a PayPal a payment general. right now. <laughs> <laughs> I need I'd love a female. To have two or three. <laughs> yeah. I um, kind of a funny story. I don't want to go off tangent too much, but um, I bought three from one fellow and three from another fellow. And I wound up with five males and one female. So I, one of the, the um, gentlemen had lost his female, so I traded him back a male. I actually gave him back one of those males I couldn't use it. So I uh, found other um, people interested in just, you know, even a male, um, having a male. So I'm hoping that, you know, in the next couple of years I can kind of get that project going a little bit more and have more available for sale. Nice. You see them once in a while on King Snake, and you know there's a couple of really really good breeders out there that are doing a good job with the the Australians. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, convince Alicia here with all this talk about the terrestrials, because <laughs> <laughs> you know there's there's another uh, terrestrial gecko, the the Picta, and I know that you work with that a whole lot. Love the Picta, um, and you know, Alicia. At least for me, you know, as I diversified from the leopard geckos and uh, the crusted geckos, I just wanted to have more different animals on the table. And I got into the Picta, and, and you know, they're super easy to keep and super easy to to feed and take care of, and very small. Uh, but they're not, you know, micro gecko size. They're still handleable and you know, uh, three, four inches in length, um, but super easy to breed. And the neat thing about the Picta, and I think that this is the reason that they're they're really popular right now, is that they have all kinds of different color morphs, and the breeders are still trying to wrap their, their minds and their arms around, you know, what some of these morphs will do and and what you get when you cross this to this. And it's it's a real adventure right now. But, you know, from a market standpoint, um, we do a lot of Picta and, and we sell to a lot of families just looking for a pet, you know, in a small enclosure that, that uh, they they can take care of for the, you know, with their family. So it's really worked out well for us to have another animal on the on the table, something not so large as a leopard and, and uh, you know, not a crusty, just something a little bit different. That was yeah. actually the... the way I was leaning toward us and kind of following several breeders with their morphs and what they're working with and it's very intriguing to me. There's some neat stuff out there with the the bold stripe and the, the snow xanthix and and you know all these other morphs and I think that you know I've seen some beautiful ones out on Facebook the last couple of days. Um a real light colored one, not a snow, but just a, a less pattern, uh, decreased pattern. And uh, I heard somebody say that they have a, uh, a purple uh, picta that they're developing, and it's it's weird. It's it's different. It's kind of exciting. Yeah, and the the market for them is is really high, and the price is you know not crazy. I know Wally, you've got you know pairs that are under hundred and fifty dollars for a pair. So that's exactly, and you can get your feet wet with you know just a, a normal pair and get some striping and and pretty much do what I did you know in the beginning and just start with a basic pair and and keep you know like like Alicia's doing it and working those lines down and and, uh, you know, getting some morphs that way. I, I probably want to bring in some different animals this year in, into my bloodlines because I've been working with them for a few years. But you can start with just a normal striped pair, and, and you just don't know what you're going to get. It, it's, um, it's wide open right now, I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
So, uh, Alicia, what are you what are you using for incubators? Right now, I'm trying out the Exoterra incubator. I'm having a little difficulty with that with keeping the temperatures regulated. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I would actually suggest ordering yourself like a hubabator or anything now because I've used the Exoterra and I've had two out of two fail halfway through the year. And oh, no. like, yeah, devastating failure <laughs> where I've I've lost like 80 eggs each time. Oh so. my goodness. Yeah, I actually started off with a um hubabator that I still have that I have set up. That's really good. Yeah, I would just keep an eye on it, like, as you're getting farther into the season, because I noticed, well, mine personally failed at, like, six months for both of them. So, but, I mean, you can always get, like, a thermostat, you know, uh, I forget who sells, somebody sells the hydro thermostat for, for seedlings and stuff, and you can use those for a, uh, heat tape and actually just convert the exoterra into a like a mini fridge style cuz it's already a mini fridge. So that would be just a good good backup for you cuz I I'd hate to see that happen. I hate it when I hear all those exoterra horror stories. Um I know I got right after I got this incubator is when I started seeing all the horrible reviews and people losing collections. Yeah. Yeah, so that's I know. When I brought... You got the what? That's when I brought the old trusty hubbivator back out of storage. Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, Jeff Scott in the chat room is saying it's the Exo Terminator. <laughs> Exo Terminator. <laughs> It's so weird because the hubbivators are so fairly inexpensive and they're so common. And, you know, I have a bunch of them and, and I've, I've built my own. Uh, I've built two incubators. And the first incubator that gets turned on in the springtime is always the hubbivators. So reliable. Yeah. yeah, for being such a simple simple thing. They, you know, it's just that, that wafer heating element and a styrofoam container I've done some min max uh reviews with with mine when I first started and I never got more than a couple of degrees over an extended period of time it just it it works Yeah Yeah I, I love it so far <laughs> So uh, I I actually have something for both of you guys cuz I know Wally you work with leopard geckos. What do you guys think about the whole controversy with the cuz we did that kill crypto episode and it's really blowing up right now. Do you guys see crypto being something that everyone's going to start testing for and really being aware of who has it and who doesn't? Go ahead, Alicia. I think that it definitely is something that everybody should be concerned about if they think they have a, a suspicious gecko that all of a sudden becomes sick. Um, I know that in the few rescues that I've done, that's my main my main worry. I think people should think about it a lot more than they do. Yeah. Alicia, what's your what's your quarantine practice? I quarantine a minimum of 60 days. Most of the time I'll keep them in quarantine for at least 90. Sounds perfect. And um what what happens with the animals when they're in quarantine? 
Um, basically quarantine. They're in a separate room from my main collection, and you know they they get their own area and they're cleaned a lot more often than the regular collection is, just to make sure that we're not spreading anything to any of the other animals. And I think that that's so key. I, I I think you're doing it perfectly well. I I think you're you're the example that everybody should be be following. Um, you know, I I've listened to that episode a number of times. Uh, a great episode. Everybody should. Anybody keeping leopard geckos should be listening to that that episode. Uh, Pat really knows what he's talking about. He he uh, he's working with some good people and and doing some good things in in the study. Um, but you know, Alicia just hit the nail on the head. Anything that comes in to anybody's uh, facility or rooms, or or even if you have one gecko and you're buying another one, um, you know, you've you've got to quarantine the animals, and you have to set them aside, and you have to treat them differently. And you know, uh, one thing that we do is that if we bring in new animals, they get worked on last. Uh, everything else gets worked on. We wash our hands. We go and work on those animals and wash our hands again. Um, but but keep them separate. And you know you're right on with 30 or even 60 days or 90 days. It, it, perfect. Keep them separate away from the other animals. Um, I you know it, it just for for us here in our facility, it's all preventative. Um, we don't we've I've never done a, a test. Uh, a fecal test. Um, I've had a, a couple animals, uh, as young animals, that looked um, like they had crypto. And again, you you try to catch it as quick as possible, and you move them out away from the other animals, and you treat them differently, and you you do the extra cleaning, and you keep their enclosure as, as spick and span as you possibly can. And and uh, the two that I had were a couple of really neat animals, a raptor and a, a really, really nice bold stripe. And, you know, I babied them and, and fed them, I actually fed them the uh, crusted gecko food for probably about a month just to get, you know, something in their systems. And But again, you know, it's a lot of time and effort and, and washing your hands and washing and washing and washing. So um, people need to know about it and, and be educated on, on the whole crypto process. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and do you guys see a? Because I, I think that a lot of people are over overreacting with the whole thing. I mean, I, I get the whole you know test your, your collection and all that. <clears throat> but do you think they're overreacting with the fact that people are wanting to have clear? fecal records when they purchase an animal? Because I, I, I see that people are afraid to even buy animals right now because, you know, since that episode has happened, people have tested geckos they're getting and now I have crypto, what do I do? And so that kind of freaks everybody out on purchasing new animals. Yeah, Alicia, is that something that that's talked about at the reptile shows that you attend? Is that part of the conversation at all? When it is, it's very hush hush. Um, I have noticed that a lot of the vendors that's not that one of their most valued topics, but I think they should be talking about it a lot more how there's always the possibility that somebody could be a carrier and expose others in the collection. Definitely. Yeah, it's hard, Wally, I think it's hard for... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Morgan. Do you, do you see that as... You know, because you're... Not, not. Ex I don't want to say old, but kind of like more in the old, uh, more experienced group of breeders. Do you, do you guys talk about stuff like that? Um, I, I think Alicia's right on again. Um, 
it is it's something that's really hush hush. I think that there's a concern, and this is exactly what you were saying that that oh boy, I don't want to talk about my animals having anything bad. I want to sell my animals, and I want everybody to look at my animals as being healthy. So I'm not going to talk about anything that's detrimental, or or somebody can. Um, look at it as being a detriment to, to them buying the animals. And that's I think that's very unfortunate. Um, I, I work with, you know, a number of breeders at, in the, the area, in the Chicago area, and, you know, we're pretty open to talking about issues. If I have an issue, I'm going to call them on the phone or, or you know, shoot them up on Facebook with a question and, and post it out there. I, if I have an issue, I'm going to go with to somebody that has that experience. Let's work with it. Something that I haven't for the benefit of the animals above and beyond everything. If I have, and I'm sure that Alicia has seen this as well. It shows if if um, I have an animal that that uh, has any issues whatsoever, maybe a little bit of a thin tail or anything. You know, is going through shed something like that, I'm going to hold the animal back and I'm not going to bring it to the show. But, you know, it's just not talked about it in the, the community. Unless you're you're really in with a couple of people and you can, you know, pull them to the side and, and talk about issues like this. Um, I think that you're right, though, that there is, you know, it can be at times a little bit overblown and and. I, I think that people need to be aware of it. They need to be educated. But, you know, I think that without the proper education and awareness, people can take it and, and uh, you know, it kind of catches on fire and and it becomes too much of a concern um, than it really is. Yeah, I definitely agree. <clears throat> For any of the listeners out there, I think that the key, though, is... You know, get the, and, and again, it sounds like Alicia is doing exactly this. Go to the shows and and walk around and look and look and look and talk and and go to the show the next time and and figure out what you want, but also get a feel for the vendors that are are um, willing to share information and also the vendors that have really healthy animals. Right, Alicia, that's probably something that you're doing when you go to the shows. Right, I'm. Definitely keeping an eye to see who has what and what their selection looks like, whether they're healthy looking versus they need a little TLC. Yeah, maybe a little thin or um, you, you see somebody that has a, a number of leopard geckos or whatever animal and they're all, it looks like they're all in shed and it just, it raises a, a warning flag. It always should. Yes. Yeah, and that's that's another thing that I I have a problem with is you know everybody wants to they see this skinny gecko and they want to save it and you know that that animal might be infected and I I know that they have really good intentions but it's it's a tough tough situation. It is. I know a lady here in in uh, our town that does a lot of rescues, and and God bless her. She's she's amazing. She's brought some animals back that I've pretty much told her I I wouldn't hold much hope for, and she's brought them back to full health. Um, it would be hard for me to be able to spend that much time with one or two animals, you know, unless I. I you know, had raised them myself and had some, you know, more emotional involvement. Um, I, I really, you know, my heart goes out and, and uh, to those people that do the rescues. I, Alicia, it sounds like you're involved with some of the rescues too. I do rescue on a small scale. Now, is that from pet stores or is that just people that, that have some animals that they can't maintain or... Uh, referrals, things like that? Um, a little of both. I have rescued from a couple of pet stores, and I also have rescued from some people who thought they knew how to take care of them, but apparently misunderstood at some point. 
the animal was just a little bit past what they could could work with? Yeah, the last couple that I've taken on were, according to the previous owner, were three adults and the healthiest one weighing 15 grams. Mm. That's hard to see. It is. Do you have any special care that you give the animals? Do you do anything with uh, Pedialyte or or any? Do you get animals in that that don't seem to want to eat? And how do you go about uh, working with those animals? Any animal that is reluctant to eat, I always do what they call the mealworm slurry with um, grinding up mealworms and Pedialyte and and so a good calcium supplementation just to get them, you know, back on their feet wanting to eat again. How does that work? How, um, what's your success with with uh, programs like that? And how long does it generally take a leopard to to start showing some signs that it it will uh, start eating solid foods again? Well, the cases that I've worked with, I've seen it take at least, you know, several weeks, if not a month, to show any improvement whatsoever. And is this with animals that are, do you, do you feel that they have crypto, or do you think that it's just miscare and, and not the right temperatures, things like that? Um, some are just, you know, I, I'm misunderstanding of how they're supposed to be cared for. And then again, I have, you know, some that I are suspicious about that, you know, I want to help them. Then again, do I want to take this on and risk spreading something to the collection that I have already? Yes. Alicia, do you get a lot of emails and phone calls asking for uh, suggestions or questions or care information, things like that, with the leopard geckos? I have. Um, I've had several people email me and message me through the Facebook page just asking basic questions. Uh, husbandry, you know, are they setting it up right? What should they be using? Is it kind of the some of the very similar questions? Do you have a list of your standard questions that you go through? Like if somebody were to email or call you and say, you know, my gecko just isn't eating. I'm not sure what's wrong with it. Um, do you kind of have your you know mental list of of questions that you ask the person? Well, always if somebody's coming to me saying that they're having trouble with and animal eating, my first question is, well, how do you have them set up? Do you find that people are pretty free in, in sharing the information, how they how they have the enclosure set up, what kind of heat, what kind of foods they're feeding, and things like that? Uh, most of the people that I've had conversations with, they're pretty pretty open wanting to know, you know, how they can improve what they their setup and what they can do to, to help the animals that they have. That's there good to hear. Some, I'm sorry, go ahead. There are some that are more reluctant to admit that you know, they may have something set up wrong. I think that's the hard part is uh, sometimes trying to get the person not to, you know, say that they've done something wrong, but just for them to uh, admit that they just haven't done all of the research and or set up the animals like they should. And um, I had one fellow that, that um, we sold an animal to, and I, I'm sure we uh, exchanged dozens and dozens of animals after he lost his, his leopard gecko after about a month or so. And uh, 
I went ahead and replaced the animal, and then when he got that one in, he asked if he should take out the, uh, I can't remember what he called it, but the heat bulb from the top, um, thermal heat something emulator, and uh, and I had gone through all the questions and the temperature and everything, but he was he just uh it just never came out that he was using this heating element and and at during the day the temperatures were exceeding i don't even know how much 120 degrees or something but at night that's when he was doing his measurements the temperatures were cooling down but it it took a long time to to get to that that point with him once we did though we were good and and you know i could share with him you know what the um what he had to do to to uh ensure the health of his animal but it took a long time to get to that point yeah and it's always good to have somebody that's willing to to help the animals in the best way possible i think we see that a lot too with uh, people are very willing most of the time are very willing to share you know how they're t taking care of their animals and and uh, they're they're just looking for you know some answers to benefit the animals. What is here's a kind of a controversial question I'll kind of throw out there. What is your feeling about substrate? I personally, I personally, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, I do not <laughs> like sand whatsoever. I just I've had too many experiences with impaction that I just I never recommend sand. I always recommend you know a solid substrate such as paper towel or a, a carpet of some kind. Or I is this most when I when I first started I actually had tile. How did that work for you? I really had good success with the tile. One, it, it was very good heat conductor, and two, very easy to keep clean. Is that what you recommend to people? You know, if they they email you or contact you, I'm not sure what I should do with my substrate. Is that your recommendation to people? Most of the time, I tell them that. If, if they have an animal on sand, that I don't recommend it just by the chance of impaction. But if they, it does make for a pretty setup. But if they do keep it on sand, I always suggest feeding in a separate enclosure. Yes. Yep. I love the mealworm cups that they've come out with um, the last few years. Um, seems to retain the, the uh, insects in one location so the, the leopards know exactly where to go. And But, you know, I do the same thing. I tell people, you know, the leopard geckos, that's what they do. They like to get their, their substrate a lot of times, so you have to have the substrate in, in there. And it's hard because some people will say, you know, my I've had leopards over sand for years and my father had and my grandfather. So they give the whole stories that, you know, sand isn't bad, but there's always that risk. And so how do you it's up to them. Yes. Yes, exactly. You can you can lead them through, you know, the the um consequences, but um, you know, it is up to them and they might want to have uh their enclosures look a certain way and I, I love your suggestion about the tile too and I've I've taken that route as well, you know, to make a more decorative enclosure, more realistic. Um, you know, the home improvement stores around our area sell the tile in boxes that are pretty reasonable and, and they even have the terracotta uh, colors and those make just perfect uh, additions to an enclosure. Why don't you take us through how you have your leopard gecko set up? Do, are you keeping all the individuals separate? Do you have males with females in some of your tubs? I try to keep everybody individually. Um, I do have okay. a couple groups where I have two to three females together. Um, I just, with my collection, I've seen that 
when they're housed individually, they seem to do better. They eat better and, and just behave better, things like that? Yeah, they eat they eat better. They seem like they're not as stressed as when they were in groups with other females. Okay. And now that we're approaching the breeding season, kind of walk us through how how you um how you start your breeding season and and uh what you do with with your animals. Well, at the beginning of each breeding season, I try to go through and the breeding size females, which I like my females to be you know, anywhere from 50 to 55 grams at the minimum. And I'll go through and make sure everybody has moist and just check on a daily basis to see who's ovulating and, you know, who's gravid and ones that I need to keep my eye on. And are you moving the, the males to the females or the females to the males? I move the males to the females. Okay. Seems pretty common in the hobby. And how long do you leave the males in with the females? When I see that a female is ovulating, I try to leave the males in at least for four or five days, and then I'll remove them and let the female kind of cool down a little and then reintroduce him. And how many times do you do the re... How many times do you reintroduce the male to the females? I'll probably reintroduce him at least two to three times. Yeah. Morgan, is uh, that kind of the schedule that you you take too? Yeah, and I w Alicia, do you have any issues with uh, like aggression or anything like that? How do you handle that? As far as aggression, uh, I do have a couple females that are more aggressive than others. Most of my breeder males seem to be pretty laid back and not as aggressive as they could be. Okay. Yeah, I, I know that uh, I've had some males that are just total, you know, puppy dogs, and they'll just do their thing. And I know Michelle's probably, I don't know if she wants me to say this or not, but uh, Mercury actually, like, the best uh, total clips so far that has hatched from her bloodline, I traded back this year, and, he ended up uh, killing her best total eclipse female recently. Oh my goodness! Which was, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't even expect it from him because he's he's not the biggest male and he's so nice and he it was yeah. So I mean, now I'm really reluctant of leaving them overnight. You know, I'd rather watch them for a few hours before I decide to go to bed with them being alone. So I just didn't know if you had what your thought on something like that would be. Well, when I introduce them, I I like to sit there and, you know, kind of gauge how everything's going. If I have a male or a female that's being overly aggressive, then I, I won't leave them overnight. I'll take them back to their individual tubs and, and just let them settle back in. Yeah. And Wally, have you ever had anything like that where like a totally docile acting animal has done something like that? I had that happen today. Um, oh. I uh, I uh, introduced a male blizzard. I've just started the introductions. I actually started all the uh, leopard gecko introductions today. And I put a uh, leopard gecko, I'm sorry, a blizzard in a real beautiful uh, blazing blizzard with a female. And he was a little bit big, but she was she was pretty hefty. I, I'm sure he was in his upper 70s and she was in her 60 gram range. 
and uh, they were fine. Then I heard the rattling, and everything, you know, seemed to be doing well. And I was on the other side of the room, and I, it sounded like a cow had fallen into the river. It, it just seemed like all heck had broken loose. And I ran over and I d identified the tub that everything was going in and opened it up. And here he's sitting on top of the tub and she's in the hide. And she had a couple of marks on her, but nothing nothing severe. So, you know, like Alicia, Alicia said, I removed the mail right away and, and uh, we'll, we'll go about this another time. Um, yeah. Normally, I, I don't have it, any issues, but this one, boy, he I don't know if he just didn't accept the female or the female didn't accept him or it just didn't work out. All right. But no murders over at Supreme Gecko? No, no, nothing dramatic. Uh, a couple of little, <laughs> little marks, but no broken skin. All right. So uh, you guys want to, I got a caller. You guys want to try to pull on Janice? again and get her in on the conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Bring it on. All right, Janice, <laughs> are you there? Janice? No, Jan Janice is still not there. <laughs> no. I know uh, Brad from uh, SC Geckos was calling, but he disconnected. Wonderful. So. No. Yeah. Maybe you'll call in later. Any any questions from the chat room? No, not not a whole lot in the chat room so far. Not since like the dubia and the the incubators, but we pretty much covered everything. Okay. I've got a question for Alicia. Um, and I kind of I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but um. As you've gotten into the hobby, into the leopard gecko breeding, um, who are some of the people? And I know you've mentioned a couple of names, so maybe I wanted to give you a chance to to kind of expand on that. Who are some of the people that um, you really look up to? That you've gone. It, it sounds like you're you're um, very open and and willing to talk to different people. Who are some of the people that that you go to and that have helped you out with the um, your experience in the hobby? Well, I've talked with several people, but the majority of the people that I deal with are locally would be like Southeastern Exotic. But as far as just looking up to people, I always keep an eye on what Ron Trimper's doing, what Michelle at Rampant's doing. Um, like I said, I just I get intrigued about new stuff that everybody's working on and how they can attribute to the hobby, making it sustain and have a better future. And where do you get um, where do you get most of your information from? Is it from uh, calling other hobbyists? Do you go on on certain forums? Um, do you get a lot of information from Facebook? I think Facebook has become so popular uh, in the last few years. But do you use a number of different resources to get your information? I do. Um, majority of the information that I've, I get is research and it's going to sound very old school, but I'm any like texture that I can get my hands on. That's always my first resource. So you have the Ron Trumper book at your uh, nightstand sitting there with a, a bookmark uh, on <laughs> page 48 and... <laughs> page 25. <laughs> page 25. 36 to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have the uh, same thing here, and I have the uh, the rack Bible from uh, Rapashi and, and DeVos sitting on my nightstand as well. Same thing. And I think it's one of those things where you've read the, the book from cover to cover and from cover to cover again, but you, you still go back to it time and time again. 
Yeah, that's, how I'm about relying on books more than anything. Yeah. How about forums? Do you visit some of the forums or or not so much? Uh, I'll glance through some of the forums just to see what the new hot topics are, what everybody is trying to you know, keep up in the air. But as far as sure. being religious, I'm not as good. I think it's hard. I think it's hard to try to keep up with forums and Facebook and, you know, your conversations, personal conversations with email and and uh, I, I, let, uh, I can appreciate your point about going back to certain books and knowing where to pull information from and having a, a reliable source that you can phone up or, or send an email to. But there's just so many different places to pull information from now. I, I think that forums were just a wonderful avenue many years ago. And they're, and they're great, you know, places to find historical information and maybe, you know, track back some lines and and uh, things like that. But with, um, you know, Twitter and and Instagram and Pinterest and Facebook and everything, it's just so hard to keep up with everything now. It is. Yeah. So we actually do have a question in the chat. <clears throat> Uh, Val is wondering, what all do we use for a substrate for the eggs? Uh, vermiculite, perlite, you know, just what do you, what do you guys use when incubating? Go ahead, Alicia. I've I've been using just straight perlite, and I've had a pretty good success rate so far. Okay. And have you, you tried? The, have you tried any of these? I'm sorry. Do you use geos or a Sims or deli cups? I've been using a mixture of the deli cups and the geos. Okay. Any difference in your results? Um, if there's any, it's very slim. I've, um, being at this for so long, um, I've tried all the, the mediums. Um, I've got to agree, though, Perolite seems to be um, my favorite. Um, if I, I um, sell a product called Supreme Hatch Material, but it's the, the aquatic pond soil, and I've had good success with that. Um, what happens, you add the water, you dump all the water off, so the, the water doesn't really touch the eggs. It is maintained in the porous clay material. That's really worked out for me, so I think it's a matter of, you know, getting some experience with the different brands. Um, somebody had asked me about vermiculite and their eggs molding and, and too much humidity, and we talked through holes and deli cups and things like that. Um, but I said, you know, some of these mediums, you really have to have a feel for how much moisture you can put in there. And we talked about squeezing the vermiculite and all, but uh, perlite just seems to be a little bit easier to use than, you know, certainly vermiculite and peat moss and some of the other substrates. Yeah, what's that uh, Supreme Hatch stuff that you sell, Wally? It's a, it's a clay material. It's a high-fired uh, clay, um, so it becomes real porous. It's little. It's used in, if anybody, people probably know this already, but it's used in baseball fields to absorb moisture. It's kind of like kitty litter, but, you know, it's a more professional um, grade used in baseball fields. Um, they use it on, on the warning track and, you know, the infield to absorb water. So um, the the neat thing about it is, and I don't mean to be promoting here, but the neat thing about it is that you add all the water. It doesn't matter how much water you add. You fill up a container and then you let it sit there for a couple of minutes and then you just dump all the water off so that there's no water whatsoever in there. But it's it's leached into the clay material and all the pores. 
And that way you don't have to worry about, you know, moisture content or how much water is okay. You just you dump it all off and then set up your eggs and little divots and put the eggs right on there. So the eggs aren't really sitting in, in the water. Um, it's a great material, especially for people just starting off because, uh, again, you don't have to worry about moisture content, but also you can tell when the material is getting too dry because it goes just like a rock that's wet as dark, and then when it dries off, it, it turns grayer or lighter. This material will, will turn lighter as well. So it's it's a material, and again, you know, I, I use perlite just as much as Supreme get, uh, Hatch material, but I take it to the shows and and sell it there for people that are getting into the hobby and, and aren't sure how to really deal with the, the vermiculite or perlite or any of the other hatching materials. That's that's really interesting. I, I like that, you know, and you can totally advertise when you come on here because that's what it's all about. So, <laughs> <laughs> and do you, do you use geos or any, do you put it right on it or... I, I've purchased a few geos, but I've just not had the time to set them up. But for this um, aquatic pond soil, the the supreme hatch material, you put the eggs right on there, so they're really not truly sitting in the moisture. They're on top of the rocks, and and it's very similar to the whole geo uh, theory, where you don't want the the eggs sitting in the moisture. You want them above the moisture, but you want the benefit of the the, the uh, humidity, of course. So, it, same concept. Wow, that's. So I'm going to have to buy some of that when I pick up a couple pairs of pictus from you when you update your website this weekend. <laughs> it, it it's really super super easy, and you know I I um, again sell to a lot of people just starting off with leopard geckos and. I think that that's the the key attractiveness of of the um, material. Yeah, yeah. Right now, I just use the uh, the perlite and the the geos, and I I try to sim incubation system, but I I was not very successful with that. I had horrible results, and actually did a video on it and sent it to them, and it it was just a big huge mess, but. I I like the the geos, but I I would be really interested in trying your uh, supreme hatch stuff. It works out well. Um, and again, I like to try to do some experiments with the geos and and see if I get kind of the same results that Alicia got. Um, I'm thinking that I think a lot of people go wrong because they put too much moisture in their their hatching material. So the, the geos just naturally takes the eggs off of the the material and i think that if if and you know we go back to ron trumper and albie shoal and oh my gosh you know kelly and and some of the uh craig stewart you know from urban gecko and these people didn't have geos and things like that and they were getting huge success rates with hatching their their animals but you know whatever works for for the breeder, that's my feeling that, you know, if it works, stick to it, and if the geo works, that's great, but I think that it's a matter of, you know, having some, a little bit of experience, experience and knowing about how much moisture and when to add water and, you know, things like that, more than, than yeah. you know, the mechanics. Yeah, and I, I definitely think uh, things like your own area where you are in the U.S., you know, because, like, where I am, it's super humid and wet and cold and I've, I've noticed getting a I have an oscillating ceramic heater now in my gecko room and that has created a completely new environment and you know everyone's eating more and I have to change humidity in the incubator and all of that so I think that that has a whole lot to do with it I, I think you're right and it's the the uh the attention to details. I, yeah. Here in Wisconsin, we're we're bone dry because everybody has their house, you know, with the plastic foam on the windows because it's <laughs> negative 600 degrees outside. And so in the house, it, you know, it, our hide boxes literally will dry out. You know, the the lay boxes will dry out in a week. You know, we can yeah. we moisten them every single week, and they're bone dry by the end of the week. So. We're we're filling the the hide boxes uh, a couple of times a week. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you there. And uh, we also we have more questions in the chat now. When when incubating, are there any different methods that? Well, you guys do the arboreal stuff, so like the cresteds, gargoyles, leos. I don't know if any of you guys do fat tails, but do you incubate those differently? Alicia? I can speak on the, the or, yeah, please. As far as incubating, um, for the crested, I really don't even put them in the incubator. I kind of let them incubate at room temperature. And how do you set those up? I set them up pretty much in the same way that I do with Leos. You know, in the in, in the I'll, in the deli cups with the pearl light. Okay. And we do and then, we do the same thing, same thing with Paralite or the Supreme Match material. Okay. Yeah, Wally, do you do the uh the tackle box? I know I see a lot of people doing the the crested geckos in tackle box up in the closet. <laughs> we uh we incubate at room temperature, um but I found that um you know, I when I was doing when I started off with crusted geckos and had more than just a handful of pairs, um, it was a lot of work to go individually through all the deli cups. And also I found that, um, and I don't know if this is, certainly nothing scientific, but um, I just felt that a lot of times I would have the second egg, not a lot of times, but occasionally, have the second egg of a crusted gecko hat, uh, um, lay uh, not hatch out. Um, and again, this isn't anything scientific, but I decided to instead separate the two eggs. I've never seen this happen with the Leos, but with the crusteds, it was it was uh, something that I had observed more than um, a few times. But I eventually decided to separate them out and had uh, had some tackle boxes because I I used to fish a lot and still fish once in a while, but had a bunch of these clear plastic tackle boxes, so I filled them up with uh, the Supreme Hash material, Paralite, and then put the in eggs individually in each compartment. And that's worked out really, really well. And um, it, it, more than anything, it gives me peace of mind that that first baby that's hatching out isn't going over there and, and playing dodgeball with that second egg. If that makes any sense at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I follow you. <laughs> I hope okay. that answers their questions in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't do the the fat tails. So, you guys don't do fat tails either, right? No. No. Wally? I don't. I uh did them a long time ago and I had uh, they beat me. Um I had the worst uh success with fat tails out of Hundred, I'll, you know, and this is a something that I'll gladly admit that uh, I just didn't get it. I, I don't know what I was doing wrong. I tried, you know, uh, cooler, warmer, drier, wetter uh, incubations, but uh, out of hundreds and hundreds of eggs, I got one baby to to hatch out and live. Wow. And I kind of attribute it to to some of maybe some of the animals that I had because again I I went back and forth and and just couldn't get it after seasons and seasons probably five or six seasons I just gave up and and said I I lose and the fat tails win and I moved on to other animals but I have a friend that um that I've been talking to here in uh Madison close to Milwaukee and and he's insisting that I take a pair of his fat tails and try again so the the fire's burning there, so I might just give it another go uh, this year. I I wouldn't. I'm kind of curious, Alicia. Are with working with leopard geckos? Is that something that you might uh, look into getting into uh, with the fat tails yourself? I've looked at fat tails several different times. Uh, I've always been intrigued by them since they are. 
so similar to Leo's and then also so different from them at the same time? And what do you think of all the different? I'm sorry. And the fact that not there's not that many people that work with them, but the people that do work with them have had great success with them. Yes. What do you think of all the different colors and and varieties of the fat tails? Oh, some of some of the morphs are just amazing. <laughs> like working with the Emils and the Oreos and the White Out, they're just mind blowing. I completely agree. It, it's a it's a fun part of the hobby, certainly, uh, to see some of these colors come out. Yeah, I definitely. Morgan, agree. Are, are there are there fat tails in your future? Um. Well, that's that's another funny Michelle story. She's kind of like the tester of projects that I take on, and uh, I, I she didn't have a whole lot of good luck with it this year. So I don't know. I I think that like Alicia said, the the people that work with them have really great success, but you know people kind of go one or two years and then if it doesn't work then they just drop that whole project so i i'm debating doing it i i tried cave geckos but i had purchased a cave gecko and then it ended up someone said that it it looked like it was old because i guess they get darker as they get older and yeah she had horrible horrible pinworms and actually mm -hmm. didn't make it i couldn't Nothing would, would work. I mean, the panicure would just... I think that she was just way too infected. So I, I'm going to stick more to the dry geckos, and it just seems like their husbandry is a whole lot easier. You know, you don't have... Especially with my, my environment around here, it would just be easier that my whole gecko room is one, you know, one one kind of area of the world, I guess you would call it. Yep. Everybody's desert yep. geckos. Yep. And that, I would think that that works pretty well with Alicia, too, is with the heat that, you know, you're getting from your bearded dragons and your euros, that just plays right into the leopard geckos. If you have them in close proximity, you you get that benefit from the, the heat from uh, the other animals. Yeah. Yeah, I do see that it works out a lot better with my desert animals in the desert room and the tropical animals in the separate room. Yes. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I need to I need to either move my bed into the living room so I can have a second gecko room or <laughs> something. I don't know. Hang a hammock in the garage and then I'll just have the whole house full of animals. Yeah, well, my tropical room is actually my bedroom. <laughs> no? Well, that, that it works too, you know. Yeah. Do you see yourself expanding your hobby in the next couple of years? Where do you see yourself in, in say, five years? Uh, I do see myself expanding. Um, I, I always enjoy adventures in in the different directions. Um, hopefully, with other other species, other than just the species that I have now, and hopefully working with some subspecies in leopard geckos and diversifying that. I don't remember, but are you working with subspecies right now? I am working with one line of fascias. Okay. But I do want to get particularly into the agroman use in the hard wiki. The Hartwicky are just 
so amazing looking. Just incredible animals. They are. Yeah. Yeah, I I, uh, I know Steve released a, a mated pair, and I actually contacted him about getting some this year, but then when he emailed me back with the price, I was like, nah, maybe I'll wait a few more years. <laughs> oh, my. And it uh, sounds like it's like anything else. They'll They'll establish themselves and maybe not come all the way down like we've seen some of the other other animals, but uh, maybe a little bit more um, affordable for some of us more common breeders. Yeah, yeah. I think that they're, they're – some people I hear, they're more like uh, fat tails where they should be grown out for 18 to 24 months, and some people say, no, they're like leopard geckos that they can breed at a year old, so – I think if if they're grown to mature it, you know, the second season, then they'll hold their market value a whole lot more because, you know, if you can't pump out eggs quickly from hatchlings, then they tend to hold their value. Yes. Totally agree. I, I think that might be some of the, the case with, like you were saying, with the, the fat tails. Um, at one point I thought, you know, all these new additions to the hobby with the fat tails, it's going to catch up and they're going to be more popular and available. And it just it doesn't seem like the market is catching up to them. They're still, uh, you know, reasonably priced, not reasonably priced, but uh, the market has established its price and, and it's holding to that price. Yeah. Yeah, I know in like uh, 2010 and 11, the whiteouts were, you know, pushing $2,500, $3,500, and now you can get them for 300 to 700 apiece. Sure. Yeah, so uh, we, we have more questions. Uh, we'll start with Alicia. For your first season... What was your uh, success rate for for breeding and hatchlings? Did you hatch out most of your eggs, or for the first breeding, I think I had a probably ninety to ninety five percent success rate. Okay. No, you have the couple few that something goes wrong and they don't hatch or, you know, developmentally something didn't go as planned. Right on. And Wally, what about you? How was your uh, first season of leopard geckos? I'm a computer geek, so I have everything on, on uh, Excel spreadsheets. So <laughs> I can go back and I, I know that... Um, I was nowhere close to 90, so hats off. Um, that's a great, great uh, success story right there. Um, I, I'm, I was probably, probably because I was experimenting too much and, and just trying to get my feet wet and everything, but I'm, I'm thinking that my hatch rate was somewhere around the, the mid-70s, low 70s, mid-70s, something like that, if I remember right. So it took a while to, to understand the whole thing, but boy, to start off with 90%, that's that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish I was, I was, a, I think I was at uh, about 1%. <laughs> 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 yeah. Or Morgan. I won't get into that story, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I I I was uh yeah that was like back in 2005 so that was a long time ago I didn't have internet or books or know how to do anything Well that's that's right because now you know if you have a question you can put it out there and you get a response within 10 minutes and you know I again you know being more a little bit more experienced or older um, when I started, and I love hearing 
Uh, Marsha McGinnis tells this story. You know, when when she started years and years ago, um, that wasn't out there, and there weren't books out there, and and the information just wasn't there. So it was all word of mouth and limited number of readers, and you checked and you recorded and you compared, and uh, now everything is a ten minute answer. It's it's different. But even you know, going back five or six or seven years ago, Facebook wasn't out there. You'd have the forums to look into, which was a great resource, but um, you know, again, you know, there's tons of different information on the internet. Yeah, yeah, I know. And uh, Facebook just celebrated their 10 year anniversary, but I sure don't remember it back then. <laughs> no, no. Well, Alicia, I, I wish you luck with the crested geckos, too, with uh, the ratio that you were getting with the leopard geckos. Um, I think that I was a little bit better with the crested geckos than I was the first year with the, the leopards. But, uh, you know, you've made some good comments about, you know, room temperature and, and uh, how you're incubating. So um, I'm, I'm thinking you'll probably be probably right around that 90% as well with the cresteds. Well, I thank you. I do pride myself in knowing all I can before I get into anything. That's so yeah, key that's in this hobby is get as much information as you can. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. And, you know, that's that's what's important is, you know, no matter how experienced or how long you've been doing it, it's always great to, you know, if somebody has a suggestion or something that worked for them to just add that into your, uh, your, your, what you do with your animals, you know, if say it doesn't work for you one year, you might want to try what somebody else said worked for them. So. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, let's try to bring on Janice again. Janice, are you there? <laughs> no, Janice. Janice isn't there. No, I guess she's not there. <laughs> so. Uh, we're coming up to the end of the the episode, so uh, thank you, Alicia, and for coming on and telling us all about your projects and all of that. And I I really look forward to seeing what you produce from the Total Clip stuff because I always love seeing what uh what my hatchlings make the next year. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Wally, for for coming on and being my guest co-host and. You think you'll come on next weekend? Um, I'll take a look at the schedule. I know I have a couple of things going on next weekend, though. I think I have a show down in Chicago. But it, this has been a blast. It's been a pleasure. Alicia, I'll be watching those uh, total eclipses that you're producing this year as well. Uh, great animal. Way to go with that that line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so thank you both for coming on. And... Uh, this episode was brought to you by our generous sponsors, Luxurious Leopards, Holly's Homebred Reptiles, Lilith's Leo Lovables, Brad at SC Geckos, and Desert Snow Gecko. So uh, I will talk to you all later, and next weekend we have Gary Orner Jr. from uh, Orner Exotics coming on, and he's going to talk about Pro Herps, and he... He's getting back to breeding with his brother and expanding and doing all that stuff. So that's going to be a really fun and exciting show. So thank you both for coming on, and I will talk to you guys later. All right. Well, thank you for thank having you, Morgan. All right. Bye, you guys. Good night. Good night. Good night.